Welcome to the Empower Survivors podcast. Empower Survivors is a nonprofit organization of survivors providing safe spaces of healing for survivors of child sexual abuse. We host different programs dedicated to survivors, their relatives, and anyone who wants to learn more about child sexual abuse, an issue that affects one out of four girls and one out of six boys. In this podcast, each week we introduce special guests and topics that are sure to be of interest. We have survivors sharing stories, conversations with mental health professionals, and experts in the domain. At Empower Survivors, we believe in breaking the cycle by healing first and building a community supporting and educating one another. Visit our website at www.empowersurvivors.net to discover our programs and take part in our online communities. Every Monday, we host an online interactive program, Conversations with Elizabeth. Every Thursday, we offer peer support groups for survivors at 6 p.m. Central Time. To participate, register online at www.empowersurvivors.net. This is your host, Elizabeth. I am the CEO and founder of Empower Survivors, a nonprofit organization of survivors helping survivors. If you want to support and donate, visit our website at www.empowersurvivors.net. It is an honor to have you here. We don't have to do this alone. We believe you, we see you, we hear you, and we are here for you now. Uh, welcome to Conversations with Elizabeth. It's great to see everybody here. This is a Empower Survivors program. So uh, tonight's recording is uh, is being recorded, just so everybody knows uh, that that is something that is being done here tonight. Monday nights are always recorded. Of course, our Thursday evening groups that are uh, peer support groups, those are never recorded. So uh, just letting everybody know that. Looks like we have a pretty good uh, amount of people here tonight. And uh, again, this is Empower Survivors. You can find out more at www.empowersurvivors.net. I'm Elizabeth, your host, and also the uh, founder and CEO of Empower Survivors. So it's great to have everybody here tonight. And tonight, uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Kristen Beasley uh, who's the founder of Leave a Life or Life Print Coaching and Consulting Inc. Throughout her professional career, Dr. B has trained community-based professionals to effectively and compassionately work with vulnerable populations. She has taught early childhood education for thousands of people. She has performed research and wrote her dissertation on infant toddler resiliency. Dr. B has also trained educators, medical and mental health advocates, and law enforcement professionals across the country. So we're really lucky to have her come to be our guest here tonight. Uh, her unique integration of early childhood education and parent-infant mental health sets Dr. B apart in the area of trauma and resilience. Tonight's topic is how to talk to kids about sexual abuse and building factors, even as an adult, to help mitigate the effects of childhood trauma, which we, a lot of us uh, listening in tonight have definitely come from childhood trauma and uh, a lot of us from childhood sexual abuse. So we're really happy to have you here tonight. Thank you and welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I Absolutely. appreciate it. So yeah, I'm excited to meet all of you and yeah, listen to, you know, Sexual abuse is such a huge trauma mm -hmm. and child sexual abuse in particular is so, <clears throat> I think in, in many, many ways misunderstood in terms of the impact because it, we, don't, we don't talk enough about development and understanding how a child perceives an experience that their body and their mind really aren't old enough to understand and so that's where this and then and then if something 
so complex, not so awful happens to a child, then they're not able to, or we're not able to, I'll say we aren't able to necessarily talk about that as a, as a parent to our young children or to other children about, so we can empower them to stop the cycle of abuse or to even recognize abuse. Because a lot of times kids don't even understand that what's happening to them is abuse, depending on the circumstance. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of us too, sometimes have difficulties of how do we talk to our kids about this and how, um, how do we let them know? And at what ages do we let them know that we've had that experience and, right. and that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Is that a question? Like at what age should we let children know? Well, it sounds like we could start with that if we'd like. Uh, I didn't know if you wanted to do a certain kind of presentation first and then open it up. Um, if you just yeah. wanted to do it more of a conversation, whatever makes you feel most comfortable, it will work for me. I feel like with a group this size that people come knowing what they want to talk about to some degree. And so, mm -hmm. and you probably, and everybody has their own experience and story around sexual abuse and, and survival. And so rather than me being the expert of everyone else's experience, I would, I would love for you to, you know, have a conversation. We can have a conversation and dig deeper into where those pockets are that are complicated for people, because we all have those unconscious pockets that where we can know all kinds of information about child sexual abuse, but we don't know what to do about this particular thing. And so I want to be there to let us have a conversation around, okay, what are those particular things that just stump all of us and then open that door? Because the, the facts about sexual abuse are really not helpful at this point. Sure, <laughs> so, sure. If that makes and sense. No, that totally makes sense. Well, if you don't mind, can I ask you? Sure. So, you know, you've been doing this work for a long time. What what led you to get into this type of this line of work? If you don't well, mind. Yeah, no, sure. I'm I'm I started my career in early childhood. So, I was really fascinated about child development and education and how children build resiliency. I don't know why I was drawn to that. And I didn't know until later. And then I started to study infant mental health. So how babies develop and how their brain develops and neurobiology of development and how some people overcome trauma and have resilience and how other people completely succumb to trauma and are not able to overcome that adversity and, and be as resilient. I am actually a product of that experience within my own family where I have, my brother allows me to share this story where, you know, he struggled very much with addiction and I actually credit him a lot with, and both of my siblings, my brother and my sister, with being sort of my protective factor. I'm the youngest. And so their ability to be protective for me allowed me to overcome adversity where for, partic for them or for particularly my brother, he ended up, you know, not having that person and that relationship where he was able to get out of addiction and thrive until much later on in his life. And so I guess there's really no way that you can, um, you know, one particular thing that led me to becoming a clinical psychologist because I started my career in education and then that led me on a path of personal self-discovery things that happened to me and things that happened to other people and then how all of those interact and create our how our brain works 
and how we respond to it and then how we heal from the traumas that we've experienced. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, alcohol and drug addictions, and it's important to note, I think that two, you know, they say two thirds of two thirds of alcoholics actually have uh, sexual abuse in their backgrounds or, or childhood trauma. So I think a lot of us um, at certain points, it's not uncommon for us to become addicts or, or have sure. issues with that. So um, right. that's something that a lot of us have to work through in order to, you know, for our healing and that sort of thing. Right. Um, are you so, familiar, are you familiar with the adverse childhood experiences study? I am, but if you okay. would like to kind of let our listeners know, I'm sure, sure that they'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Okay, some, some, some of you shook your head yes, too, but I'll just do a quick overview. I was just recording some classes earlier today um, about trauma and adverse childhood experiences and how there's a direct correlation between childhood trauma and mental health and physical health consequences. So they impact our body and our mental health as well. So people who suffer from adverse childhood experiences, which in the study only lists 10. However, in real life, we all know there are lots of things that could be considered a trauma that impact our physical and mental health. So we can suffer from depression, anxiety, diabetes, a, struggling with alcohol, and drug addiction, uh, a variety of other consequences from, from suffering from childhood trauma, as well as our intergenerational transmission where we carry that on with our own children. So either we, we end up pulling way back from it, don't have children, or we recycle our own parents' parenting and do it over again until we begin to learn the story, tell the story, and reenact the story in a way that's healthy and safer and makes sense to us. Everyone's story has to make sense to them. We have to be able to tell our own story from chapter one to chapter 100. And when we can tell our own story and bring that unconsciousness to light, then we're able to heal from that trauma and move forward and we can share it. And you, you, you brought up the question or the comment, you know, at what point do we talk to kids about sexual abuse or what time do we, at what point do we tell our children, oh my gosh, this happened to me. Something bad happened to me, whether that's mm -hmm. physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, something. Well, I believe, I think that when we can start to talk to young children in very appropriate ways, we talk to kids at their developmental level about anything, including sexual abuse, from the very beginning, that that's the safest way to keep them safe. Because if they're able to, when children understand from the very beginning of life, that their body is their body. And are we gonna be able to explain sex or a sexual activity to a child who's prepubescent? No, can't do it. It's like trying to explain sand on the moon to those of us who've never been to the moon. Like it just, there's no way to understand that because there, there's just, it's not possible. However, we can start to instill these concepts in young children and little, little children. Your body is your body. It's, it's never okay to keep a secret. You have safe people in your life who you can share, share a story with and it's not breaking a secret. And some Absolutely. of these things can be really difficult, you know, in families, you know, because they don't want little children to be able to say no to, you know, grandpa. I don't want to sit on grandpa's lap. I don't want to kiss grandma goodbye. I don't want to 
I don't want somebody picking me up and touching me. I, I'll share a story. I had an uncle who, whenever I walked in the room, and I was four, whenever I walked in the room, he would pick me up, hold me in his arms in front of the whole room, my parents, my siblings, and he would French kiss me. Okay, talk about, and stick his tongue in my ear. Okay, so inappropriate. Not about me. This is, I'm four. I have no control over this. My feet are off the ground. And I would remember that I would, you know, put, push my lips together. And that person, I never questioned. I knew I didn't like it, but I didn't question it because my parents were present. When I actually recognized that as an inappropriate interaction with an adult, not until I was 14, and actually now I'm in adolescence and I know what French kissing is. And I went, wait a sec, big memory back to that. I went straight home and said to my mom, like, what were you thinking? Why did he do this? You know, what's the, what's the deal? And she was in the room and never recognized that. So it requires everybody to be persistent about watching the environment having open conversations and telling other adults in the space that, you know what, we're, we're all in this together as, as protectors and parenters of all children. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it, you know, you bringing this up, um, no, as far as me, I started to speak with my kids at a pretty young age. And part of that was due to um, suddenly having to deal with my own abuse that I had put so far away. And I need them to understand that, you know, mom being a little different than usual and kind of hiding out, kind of figuring out my head and, and going to appointments uh, wasn't because of them. It was because mom had some things happen when she was young and, and we're now dealing with it. And, and in talking with family members, you know, I try and stress to to the adults that it's important for them to know what childhood sexual abuse is, to be able to recognize grooming, to also, like you said, give these kids permission to be in charge of their own bodies. So instead of forcing them to hug or kiss or any of that, um, leaving it up to them. So the kids, you know, if they don't want to give a hug, give a fist bump or something like that. And I and also know that anything that makes you feel icky, that you get that icky feeling, that it's okay to say something. And if you're getting that icky feeling, it, it can be a sign. Um, so I think it's really important to have the conversations. And like you said, there's things that we can bring up um, at very early ages and that sort of thing. And, the, and then like, a, like I did with my kids, it was always, okay, well, we had the conversation once in an age appropriate way, but we still need to keep having it. So, um, you know, that's, that's something that I think a lot of families can learn and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. Would you mind if I opened up questions to the group here? No, that's fine. It's great. Yeah. So it looks like we got a good group here tonight. Um, does anybody have a question or comment? Uh, and Mary does. So go ahead, Mary. Um, thank you for uh, coming on tonight and, and sharing this information. A lot of things are going through my head because I've dealt with a lot of, I had some sexual abuse of myself, but my ex-husband uh, over the years sexually abused my, my kids. And then telling my grandkids was I it wasn't my job to do it and they didn't want me to which I totally regret now but I'm looking at <clears throat> what's going on in society today and you know I know the vaccination is it's not the subject we want to talk about but the mixed messages that kids are getting about whether they have a say in what's happening to them because parents are making a decision about something being done to them and they may not want to. Uh, I think that's that's another leg that we're going to have to 
deal with probably a little bit later on. So when we are faced with decisions about how, making choices for other people. So a friend of mine told me that her daughter-in-law was furious with her son because he did not get vaccinated. And I asked her, I said, so does she believe in my body, my choice? And she said, oh, absolutely. And I said, does it work that way for men too? My body, my choice. Does it work that way for children too? So I think my question is, where do you see opening up even that Pandora's box along with not only sexual abuse, but all kinds of abuse? Sure. Yeah, it is a Pandora's box. We certainly know that because my body, my choice is being challenged all over the place at this moment in history um, in relation to vaccines, in relation to uh, the shift in Roe v. Wade and state rights. And so in terms of just very, very general behaviors towards each other, is it okay to touch somebody without permission? And what do we mean when we say consent? You know, what does that mean and who does it apply to? And who gets to decide if we consented or not? So these are all really big, important issues and questions. And, and it's interesting, that's such an interesting story that you're sharing about a vaccine and a parent. I have a, a friend of mine who's a pediatrician and he has a patient who's 14 and really want, has to go to middle school, really wanted the vaccine and his mom said, absolutely not, you can't have it. And so, Exactly. Where do we draw the line? Who do we decide to allow to make choices about other people's bodies? And at what age do we decide it's, it's the child? And I, you know, I have very big personal feelings about that. Um, and I think that they change depending on the, you know, the vaccine issue is different for me than the uh, right to choose issue versus, you know, children have to have trusting, loving adults who can be their supporters, who can be, who can help them to think through at an age appropriate way, how to think about something. And so, and then they can make pretty good decisions at a pretty young age. So in terms of sexual abuse, we want to talk to young children about what does a secret mean? Who can you tell a secret to and have it still be a secret? It's like an allowed secret. You share it with somebody who can help you figure out a secret. Uh, who, who are those people in your life? I don't think that changes so dramatically when, when we're talking about other ways in which our bodies are touched. In terms of health and vaccines, we make those decisions for babies right as they enter the world. So we decide if babies are gonna be vaccinated and we do that for reasons of preventing illness, not only within the, within the child, but illness within our whole society. So unfortunately, I mean, you're right, this isn't about <laughs> COVID-19, but um, you know, we've, uh, we've allowed politics to take over vaccine, the, the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's, that's complicating things for us in so many different ways. And it's challenging our relationships on so many different levels. I talked to a friend yesterday whose who's mom is anti-vaccine and her and her kids are pro-vaccine. And so they're just in this, you know, entangled battle with each other around, around the issue of vaccines. And they can't even have a civil conversation about it. And I know so many families who are in that boat, even friends who are in that boat. 
So I think that what we have to do when we don't agree on things, first, we have to be willing to come to the table and have a civil conversation and say, okay, I wanna put my points on the table in a loving but, but civil way or loving and civil way. And I want you to put your points on the table in a loving civil way. And let's see if we can figure out what makes sense around this particular topic for a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a 30-year-old, or a 15-year-old and a 30-year-old and a 80-year-old, you know, across the lifespan, because it might be different depending on ages or stages of life. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question, Mary. Uh, yeah. Stacy also had a question or a comment. Go ahead, Stacy. Hi. So I, I have two things. One thing, um, talking about secrets and talking to children, one thing I... I stumbled on a YouTube video by a woman. I think her name was Feather. That's what I remember. And I think she was, um, I think she was a, a certified or she was a psychologist and she was, um, she does workshops on teaching children. And one thing that she said to me um, or that she said in this video that I thought was really interesting was um, when, you know, I tell all my friends, they all say, oh, I talk to my children and they tell me if something was happening. And I'm like, no, they're not. They're not going to tell you what's happening. We all know that, right? We all know the dynamics because it's someone they love. It's they're threatening them or they're making them special. So no matter what you say, they're not going right. to tell, right? right? And they don't believe you. But and then she did say, "I tell children you have permission to tell." Because she said, "What if, what if you go to a child and you say, you would tell me, right? You would tell me if somebody touched you inappropriately in the wrong way. And what if it's already happened? Then the child is like, oh." I did something wrong because I didn't tell and now I can't tell because I'm going to be yeah. in trouble. So she said, I say, I give you permission to tell me whenever you need to. So I thought that was a really cool thing because it changes the whole dynamic of how the child is going to perceive it. Absolutely. You know, and I wish somebody would have done that for me, for sure. Mm -hmm. And how many people, is there anyone else out there who, no matter how young you were, um, the recollections you have, you immediately felt like, why did I cause this to happen even when you were really little? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Oh, is there anyone else out there who, when the sexual abuse started, from what they can remember, the immediate feeling was, what did I do to cause this? I mean, even when you're only five. Sure or even younger. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, because I'll let anybody answer if somebody wants to respond to that. In other words, um, why do well, some people feel guilty immediately and others, I, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think that's a great question. And I think they're, you know, every survivor is gonna be different, but I know uh, oftentimes, and maybe, you know, Kristen, you can chime in too, uh, and, but I think what even enforces that is if you've had multiple abusers or multiple times, then I think it's real easy for the child because a child is looking at the adults as all knowing. And if the adults say that this is okay or this is happening, then that the child takes it on like, well, um, it, you know, this is something about me, or or maybe they've been told during the, you know, during the abuse um, that the, you know, some perps will tell kids, hey, you know, it's you're making me do this, or you know, but yeah. I think a lot of this gets put on kids, and and we have kids that will know that you know, hey, something's going on here, but we also have a lot of them that take it all on, all the blame and shame and everything else. And, and some, you brought up a good point too, uh, Stacy. you were mentioning about, um, I'm trying to remember what you said here. 
It's about giving somebody well, to tell instead of saying you would tell me if somebody touched yeah. you. Absolutely. And and that made me remember a time when I was talking to an adult niece of mine. She had five little girls. And so we were talking about the importance of having conversations young and discussing, you know, body and this and that. And and she had said to me, she goes, well, Aunt Lizzie, um, the kids know to always come to me. And so I said, well, that sounds good, but let's do a test. So all the little girls were playing. And I said, hey, girls, if an adult says to do something, is it ever okay for a child to say, no, I don't want to do that? Well, every one of the kids I mean, they're raising their hand. They're thinking this is all fun. And they're like, oh, no, you always have to listen to an adult. Mm -hmm. this is, so that created a whole new conversation. And, of course, she was kind of devastated because she's thinking, oh, my gosh, I thought the kids would just know, you know, certain right. things. And, of course, we all know that's not yeah. true. So, uh, Dr. B, I'm sorry. I probably no, it's fine. probably no, that's talked great. right over you. No, so. you, you you sparked my thinking about our our adult expectations of children that they're very mm -hmm. much like mini me's and they're not at all like mini me's. They don't think and conceptualize experiences the same way that adults do. And every age and stage of development, they do that so differently. And so having realistic expectations as a parent related to the age of a child is critical. We have to know what we can expect and expecting a child to come to an adult with a store, a, a secret about sexual abuse is a really tall order for a very young child because there's just no, no framework for them to talk about sexual experiences or and sexual abuse when you're a very young child it's it's just not not a thing and yet it happens and what if that person is the father the grandfather the loving uncle the brother the neighbor somebody that everybody loves and adores including you the victim then it becomes mm -hmm. even more complicated and our brain forces us to say I either need to put this away, I need to put this into a box that I can, you know, try to make sense out of and go along with the loving person, or I need to come forward, but I don't know how, like, I don't know how. So there's, there's so many rabbit holes that every single sexual abuse experience includes right? There's age, there's stage, there's the perpetrator, the relationship to the perpetrator, the relationship the parent or the loving adult has to the perpetrator. Because what if I come forward and they don't believe me? What if it's, you know, my mom's husband, then, and my mom then rejects it, me and doesn't believe me. So there's, there's all of these factors, which are, for us as adults, we can hold them separately. But for a child, they don't have the capacity yet because they're not mature enough to be able to hold several different thoughts separately at the same time. And that's really important for all parents to know is that young children can't hold these things out separately. So we have to do it for them and we have to spell it out up front. And I love your story, um, Stacy, about giving children permission. I often like to say, um, let me help you with the words. Here are the words of this happening. If somebody puts their hands on your private parts and you don't like it, that's sexual abuse. Okay, we've just said all the words. <laughs> like, okay, we're not even gonna mess around with, you know, we're not gonna mess around with being vague with young children because children are very concrete. So we have to explain things to children in very concrete ways and then allow them to have those conversations with us. And 
I think this is what happens some of the time. Children then play with language and get in trouble for it. So think about it. Seven-year-olds typically play the show me yours, I'll show you mine, you show me yours game. It's very developmentally, well, let's say between five and seven. It's not outside of an age appropriate thing to do like, whoa, you've got something totally different than I do. And I, you know, let's, let's look. But if then a child is shamed for doing that rather than educated about it, then that shame becomes part of the story when somebody else comes along, an adult in an abusive sexual way and takes advantage of a child and then the shame won't allow a child to come out and share that with anyone because they do feel like, I don't know what your name is, but you're on Stacy's screen. You said like, where does that go? It goes into this, you know, the shame space. So do you, don't, don't you think too, I mean, the reasons that some little, I mean, it makes sense that little kids would take this on thinking this is all me, it's my fault, because little kids, I mean, everything's about them. They're not thinking yeah. about other things. So egocentric. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, it, it just makes sense that a little person's going to think, hey, this is my fault because, you know, the adults are all knowing I'm, right. I'm egocentric and so it's got to be me. I mean, psychologically. It's my that, fault and I'm the only one it's happening to. And if you have five little girls in a family, the likelihood is it's not just you. It's likely mm -hmm. that it's everyone, but nobody's going to tell. Mm -hmm. I didn't. So do you so do you think then what about school programs and education so like is the family the best place or do you think if family people can't do it if people are uncomfortable in their families why aren't we seeing more of it in the schools as well, a starting from kindergarten going up and do you think that's effective do we have evidence-based programs i absolutely programs? think that we should be talking about sexual abuse in or, from the very beginning of life, I believe that we should be talking about sexual abuse. And I'll just call it sexuality because children are aware of their bodies and their bodies incrementally change across development. And so, yeah, we need to be talking to, we need to connect children's brains with their bodies, allow that to be okay. And what we do is instead we separate it, you know, oh my gosh, don't, don't be comfortable with your body. Of course, I think that sex education from the beginning of school should be part of the curriculum now. I, and I think that there's evidence-based information that we know that that reduces sexual abuse, that reduces teen pregnancy. I mean, there are, lots and lots of benefits. However, we also live in a political world where, you know, people have options and get to make choices about opting their children out of things like that. And so what do we do there? What do we do with that? That's, that is a million dollar question that we all have to ask ourselves. Is the value so critical that we make it a law? But what and about training programs for parents? Is there is there any like practical training programs for parents out there that they can go to make it easier for them to talk about it or families? Well, I think that parents have to want to go and parents in a lot of cases are super overwhelmed, super, they just, they're overwhelmed and they don't have childcare. Sometimes they don't have resources or transportation to get to a training. Now we have Zoom, but if they're, you know, if a parent has five littles at home right now, can they really be on a Zoom call? Which is why we need to make it more accessible. Things change in waves. This is in some ways gonna happen as a result of transitioning generations because younger generations are far less tolerant of the concept of um, oh, just go sit on grandpa's lap so we can take a picture. 
not my kid. Like my daughter's 28. She's she would absolutely never send my granddaughter onto anyone's lap unless my granddaughter was like climbing up on someone's lap. So and the conversations and the concept of consent are right on the surface for her for the millennial group in a lot of ways. Not all, but in a lot of ways. It's much more uh, conversation friendly to talk about to young children. Where in my generation, like I like I shared with you earlier, I didn't even it didn't even occur to me that what this person was doing to me was wrong or bad. I just knew I didn't like it, but I didn't think I should tell anyone. I just tried to manage it myself and avoid it. But if somebody had said to me, hey, Kristen, it's never okay for somebody to touch you in a way that you don't, you don't like, that makes you feel icky, somebody used the word icky. That's a perfect word for littles. Somebody does that, it's okay to come to me and we'll, we can have a conversation about it and I'll keep you safe and we can talk about it. Then I probably would have been like, oh yeah, remember that? My uncle M did this thing to me and I didn't like it. And so then it would have like burst the whole thing open, right? Instead, mm -hmm. my aunt who I adore divorced that person. I never saw him after the age of five. But who knows where he went, who knows what he would have done after that, or who he, who he had access to after, you know, my particular family. So we have to be able to put the words on the table for children to grab and use. When we don't do that, we, we expect them to do things that they're just not capable of doing. They don't even know to do that, that they're allowed to do that. Just like saying no to an adult. You're not allowed to say no to an adult. So I don't know if you're familiar with, um, it's, a, it's a book series called A Kid's Book About, and it's um, this particular book, which is upside down, is called a kid's book about sexual abuse and it's by evelyn yang and her husband ran for president but evelyn yang came out and shared about her sexual abuse by a her obstetrician her gynecologist sexually abused her during her pregnancy and she didn't come out and tell anybody about it for years and she's an adult she's educated she's i mean but, but the shame didn't allow her and the fear of people not believing her that kept her from telling. Now, if we can't expect a grown, educated, competent, powerful, pretty powerful woman to come out and share about her sexual abuse experience as an adult, how in the world can we expect a little young child to share about their sexual abuse experience in their in their childhood during during their childhood we can't and so we have to so she wrote this book and it's it's a book for children to be read with an adult and it's a it's really a great book as a, a share to the book series uh, it's called a kid's company about and they, they write all sorts of books about a kid's book about addiction, a kid's book about technology, a kid's book about all kinds of, a kid's book about shame, depression, alcoholism, you name it, divorce, optimism. I'm writing a book called A Kid's Book About Resilience. So there's all these themes that in this book uh, bring a parent, an adult and a child together to learn to talk about something that's hard to talk about, but it allows the child permission to have a conversation about something that would otherwise be pretty taboo. Absolutely. And I actually had uh, two things I wanted to add. Um, Stacy had said, you know, what, what about schools? And I think the big thing with schools, because you look at uh, Aaron's law where 
you know, I don't know uh, who all knows about Aaron's law, but it's a law that that uh, Aaron was trying to get passed, and every she's a survivor herself, but she was trying to get it passed in every state that um, schools add this to their curriculum, prevention of sexual abuse. And unfortunately, it was, you know, fortunately, it has been passed in states but unfortunately, there isn't a curriculum that goes along with that. So we're still not seeing the education in schools. Now, when it comes to schools, you know, it's there's a lot of thought out there that, well, we can't introduce sexuality to kids at a young age. But I would argue that we don't need to necessarily uh, talk uh, sexuality, but more so in in age-appropriate terms, uh, talk about safety, body safety, talk about, um, and, and, and I always have to say too, we can't leave this to little kids to figure out. We as adults need to be empowered to learn the information. And I would suggest to people, there's a great uh, nonprofit called Darkness to Light. They actually offer uh, programs that help train the adult on how to keep kids safe and also uh, different steps on, on um, <clears throat> you know, educating and, and learning the steps and, and how to keep children safe, uh, but also empowering kids to grow up in a home where it's okay to talk about feelings. It's okay to talk about certain things that may be troubling them. I think a lot of times in abuse, abusive homes, they don't have that space to be able to come forward or if there's you know, unhealthy relationships and their family origin and this sort of thing, kids aren't being empowered. So it's my opinion that um, it does need to be taught in schools because we can't expect kids that may be getting sexually abused at home to have to be in a place to be actually able to tell mom or dad if right. dad's the abuser or mom's the abuser or brother or sister's the abuser. Um, that's pretty hard for a child to be able to have a healthy enough mindset to be able to have a family member to go to. So darkness to light can be a, a great um, spot for that. Um, but also, as I think ultimately, it's all of our responsibilities as adults to make sure that children are, are, are safe, that children understand um, what's appropriate and what isn't, and that it's not just um, what they're, if they're being told to touch somebody, but if somebody is doing something like putting something inside the person's mouth or, or whatever, there's all different ways. So I think it's, it's uh, really, really important to educate our kids, but mostly to make, to educate adults and also for adults to know if they suspect something, it's not their job to figure it out necessarily. Let let protective services figure it out. And if there's a question at all, um, you know, ask it. But one of the top things that Darkness Light will say is there should never be a time where a child is in a room alone with an adult. So there's things that you can do within your churches, within your schools, which in within your communities where you can ensure the safety of a child. So you never have them in a position where something like something as simple as letting Johnny run to the bathroom at the mall by himself. Well, that's not safe because kids can get molested in the bathroom at the mall or, you know, sending, sending somebody off into, you know, off with somebody that maybe is a boyfriend that you know maybe that boyfriend um looked for the single mother to that had kids and was tired and and uh, needed extra help so there's things that we can do as an 
as adults. I think Darkness to Light is a great uh, resource. There's, you know, you can Google things on the internet. There's all kinds of uh, different programs or, or different literature where you can learn on that. And, and I just think that's a really uh, great thing that, that adults can be empowered enough to learn the education and, you know, but we also need to have that in the schools. But it comes yeah. down to are we teaching our kids sexual sexuality or are we teaching them safety? And I think if it's words are huge and I think you're going to get a lot of backlash if you're trying to introduce something that appears to be sexuality in the kindergarten rooms or first or second. But when we talk about body safety and good touch, bad touch isn't enough. It's other things. Um, One of the you things. Know. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. And and then when you're done, Dr. B, um, CS had a question too. Oh, okay. But you go ahead. All right. Well, what I was just going to say very quickly is I think it's so ironic and so wrong that introducing sexuality or sexual words or safety, sexual safety words in kindergarten is so like, oh my gosh, we can't do that. But it's perfectly fine to protect people who molest, rape, and sexually assault children. Whoa, wait a minute. What's wrong Absolutely. with us? Why in the world are we so concerned when, when one in three women are sexually assaulted in their lifetime? Why are we so concerned with saying the word sex to a kindergartner? They're playing sure. Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> They're playing, you know, I mean, this is, this is, they're, they're pimping out women on their video games. I mean, this is not, this is a cultural extreme that we're in, in terms of overly protecting perpetrators and underly protecting children. And it needs to become all of our job. Just like we think of gun safety, we need to think of body safety. If you're not, Absolutely. if you, if, if I would hold somebody accountable, hello, we just arrested two people for allowing a 15 year old to get a gun and then go shoot a school, shoot up a school and mur and kill people, murder people. They're being held accountable for that negligence and resp of responsibility. In my world, I think that we should feel, we should feel the same way about children and sexual abuse, that it is all of our responsibility to be saying, hey, you know what? It's not, the kids who are gonna get sexual abuse curriculum in school are not necessarily the kids that we need to be protecting from sexual abuse at home. It, whether we tell, whether they tell or not, doesn't protect them. We have to find strategies that actually hold the perpetrators and the abusers accountable in a way that's harsher than what we do right now is hold children accountable. And we punish children. We send them back into the home. We tell their parents who are in a relationship who don't believe them with the perpetrator. We do all these things that make it impossible for our littles to be safe because we want to be sure to protect the, the perpetrator. And I'm just so not on board with that. And I think, yeah, we don't have good curriculum. And as a person who professionally trains and consults in as a business i don't believe that you can somebody could take my training and walk away with it and then use it in their classroom and do it justice because mm -hmm. i do believe that people have to what i don't what i don't do is give people training to train i say if you want to learn about training something then you need to learn that material inside and out and we will build your training to use in your classroom with your audience with your children and your parents because nothing is that universal and we know that sexual abuse is so diverse like there's so many different ways to sexually abuse or assault a person there's too many choices we got to we have to keep it simple with littles keep it really simple this is your body and nobody should touch it and when you feel like it's been violated what does violated mean when you get that icky feeling 
Trust your instincts. That's your brain keeping you alive. That's its only job. Your brain is to keep you alive. And when your brain pops and says, that's not okay, I don't think that feels right, I need to be allowed to go to a safe person. And that safe person then has a full blown responsibility to keeping me safe, not turning me back over to the abuser, which we do all the time, unfortunately, all the time, all the time. And we all have to be held accountable for that. But I will say this, I think it's fascinating that we're all women here and we need to bring men on board and men need to become responsible and hold other men accountable for their abuses because really men who rape, sexually assault, sexually abuse women give good men a terrible name. Absolutely. Makes all men seem like horrible people. And I'm the mother of two adult sons and I have a son-in-law. So I have three beautiful adult men in my world that I love to death who I do not. I am not okay with them not being held responsible for other men. And I fully expect all my boys to stand up for women and, and children at all times in the arena of sexual abuse. And we've, and I've had, we've had this conversation as a family of adults because we have, I have one granddaughter, she's six, but you know, her mom and dad are very, like we're all really clear about where this little is allowed to be. And you have to be like that. And it's not because there's all these sexual abusers in our family or our house, but it's because if we don't do it on the front end, we certainly do not want to risk it on the back end. We're not willing to risk Charlie's virginity or her, her humanity without having this conversation up front ahead of something terrible happening. And terrible things happen and people can heal and people can overcome and be amazing afterwards. However, if we get a choice, have it happen or not have it happen, let's pick not have it happen. So Absolutely. somebody had a question. I just had to get uh, my, my rant on. <laughs> no, I, I thank you so much for that. You. Uh, CS, you had a question or a comment? Yes, thank you, um, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, um, Kristen. Um, everything you're saying is like really resonating as far as how kids think. Um, I had put my hand up back when Stacy was speaking and said, does anybody else relate to this? And so I put up my hand and you said like, does anyone want to answer? I put up my hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I, long, I only see a couple of people on my screen. A long time ago. Let me That's see okay. if I, let me, I'm going to see if I can get everybody on my. Just click on participants and you'll see everybody. Um, the hands will go on the top, but anyway, um, so I just wanted to, after everything that's been said in between, the most important thing I want to speak to is um, for myself and others who, you know, others like me who did not feel icky, you know, I just want to speak for myself who did not think anything was wrong, did not, did not, could not even fathom. Um, Thank you, CS. You know, you know, there's, you know, like, like, um, if anyone's seen the documentary Leaving Neverland, um, I know I'm not alone because I got to see that documentary and I got to hear them saying, you know, how much they, um, they were for what was going on. They would not have wanted that to stop. They would not have wanted, you know, they thought that this was real love and, and, and they, they just, you know, figured that's, you know, they just believed everything they were told. This is what, this is what love is. And, in my case, um, you know, just being so young that I didn't have, you know, first of all, having a mother who is extremely affectionate and maybe that could be a form of grooming, you know, she was maybe overly affectionate, you know, it was not an intentional or abuse or anything, but, you know, I was kind of like a little puppy dog or something that she was always petting. And I just thought that means that, you know, that's what your family does and that, that means they love you. And when my grandfather did it, to me, it was like, there, there couldn't, like, it must be okay because he's my family. It must be okay because he's an adult and everyone else hangs out with this guy. Like he's just part of the family. So I didn't understand it. 
But if you would have asked me at the time, you know, I would have had like, eh, you know, mixed feelings about what he did. Some of it, I, I just didn't understand. Um, you know, or some of it, I, you know, I'd rather do without. It's like maybe like eating your vegetables, but you still think, I mean, I still thought that this must be, you know, for my, you know, good for me. And, I, and I've heard so many stories since then, you know, to, that, that validate that experience and so many, you know, especially with people with doctors, um, you know, like, especially the doctor will say like, yeah, well, this is how it's done this. And who are you to question, you know? Um, or yeah, just so many situations and so many people uh, people who are, you know, their parents don't abuse them, but their parents send them off with other adults to do things and the adults don't hurt them. And they just think, oh, I'm making money for the family, you know, um, and they never actually, you know, there was a survivor who was talking about it and said, like, she didn't think there was, she just didn't think there was anything wrong with it. She had no idea um, because, you know, it was just something she did to help out the family. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to speak that, that the language, um, wouldn't maybe maybe wouldn't have worked for me you know if somebody said like is anyone making you uncomfortable because like what you know i i the way i usually tell it is i say there's categories of different touches from my grandfather there was the ones that you know i looked forward to there was the ones that i could care less and there were the ones that really puzzled and confused me um but still none of it was like scary i didn't feel like no, I didn't know anything was wrong. I just thought that, but but I did want to answer Stacy's question, which was, did anyone else feel, you know, like it was their fault? And and as a person, as one of the people who, who didn't even think it was wrong, I just wanted to affirm that even I still thought that it had to do something with me. Like, why does he do? You know, it's it's this weird thing. I mean, I guess I thought that's just his way. That's just how you know. Old people, they're weird. They do weird things. Who knows why they do what they do? He hums under his breath all the time without realizing it. And that's just grandpa. He he does these, you know, I won't name anything explicit, but, you know, inappropriate touches. Why? Who knows? You know, I just figured that's, but I still eventually started to think it must be something about me. It must be something about me. And so that's what led me to tell my mom with, with uh, excitement and pride that this meant I was like really, but like I figured out that it was I was so special. So that's that's what led me to tell. But you know, the yeah, I don't. I I do. I do have a lot of. Um, I have been questioning this a lot. Like, what could have been done um, to prevent that? I mean, there's so many things. My aunt could have told anyone other than their mother, who covered up for her husband that they were abused they could have told my father who had no clue that, my, that 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 his father was a pedophile um you know and my my mother could have could have told authorities instead of just telling my dad who was divorced um my dad instead of just wondering well let me see if this is true and let me try to catch him he could have you know um talk to me about it but my mom told him well she seems like really awkward so don't you know but anyway um uh yeah so that so I don't want to take up too much time but yeah I I just there's so many like ways but I just I don't know that saying like is you know if you're be if you feel icky I think it should be maybe a conversation about um how do how do adults show you that they love you tell me how how different adults, you know, how do they touch you? Maybe asking, I think that that might've, I could have said, well, you know, grandpa, he does. And I would not have any clue until the look on my mom's face, I would have no clue that this was not normal or something was wrong. Right. So, that's, that's I, I totally hear you, which is why I think leaving the responsibility to the children is just so not, not our most effective way to go. I mean, incest within a family wasn't even illegal in the 70s because it was too disruptive. Like to per to prosecute a family member who had sex with a child within a family, and I, I say sex very loosely, who, who sexually abused a child in a family, they literally did not want to prosecute a family member because it would be too disruptive for the family Wow. and allowed instead for the child to just remain in the family. And that's, you know, 
we can't leave it to you or any other little to figure out the problem. It's our job to figure out the problem as adults. And that means we have to have watchers on littles all the time. And we have to have communication that we are having with children all the time and that children have safe and loving relationships with people who they can talk to, who will protect them in their lives. Because that's what actually leads to resiliency and overcoming adversity if something bad does happen. So I want to let Amanda get in, but I just had to say um, that. Yeah, and CS, I have to say thank you so much for bringing that up. And as you were talking, you know, it, it kind of made me think back. Uh, I had several perpetrators. I know that there were certain ones that were cruel. And so, it, and then there was one that was really loving, so, which is confusing. But as a child, I never knew what that was. And in fact, I was in my 40s and still trying to figure it out. And I had to have, I mean, when the box flew open and suddenly I'm dealing with the abuse front and center and having flashbacks, I had to I had to actually ask the therapist, is that was that what was that? And they looked at me like it's kind of odd you're asking this as an adult woman. This this particular one didn't know trauma like we do now. Um, but you know, so you're right. You're bringing in things that are it's it's great that that was brought into this discussion. So thank you so much. And and for many of us, even when we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, and we're in recovery, we're trying to figure out what was that? Was it molestation? Was it rape? You know, there's certain certain perpetrators I had where definitely as an adult, it's like, yep, that was rape. That was molestation and rape. But then there was some where it was like, well, well, wait a minute, what was that? And they said this. And because it happened so young, I didn't have I didn't have what I needed to be able to know what that really was. So thank you so much, CS, for bringing that up. And with that, Amanda, I know you've been waiting a while. So let's get you on here. And then, Mary, we're going to go to you. Oh, did we lose Amanda? You know, we might have lost Amanda here. here. But she doesn't have her hand up. She put her hand down a long time ago. Well, no, she just had it up a second ago. I just saw it. There's, there's a couple different Amandas. The one that I'm referring to was just here, and she just dropped off. So, Mary, we'll go ahead with yours. And then hope that the other Thank Amanda gets back you. Thank here. you. And when Amanda comes back. I could spend days with you, Kristen, and I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I'm really thinking that you're a coach, right? And you teach. So I think I need to connect with you. And <laughs> I have to laugh at CS when she said, who knows what old fogies do? And I'm like, oh, here I am. I always wonder why I'm the oldest one in these groups. And there's been so much going on. And as you talked about what happened at different ages and things and, and CS, also talked about that. So in 1984 is when I uncovered the incest in my family. And my ex-husband had been abusing our children since birth. And my daughter thought something was odd at the age of eight because she saw something on, I think, Phil Donahue. It wasn't until she was 14 and that I was able to really uncover it and get her to tell me. But the secrets remain in my family, even though I have now become the villain because I wrote my book and I exposed him uh, in 2017. And still my family kept that secret. They all knew because we told them about the incest and sexual abuse and they protected their children by not telling them. So we have a whole history here of how the generations have developed and I was the horrible person who kept pushing and pushing and pushing. So I really feel like I've felt for a very long time that I need to be able to tell my story 
and to be able to go in front of organizations, all kinds of groups. And you mentioned that there aren't men on. There, there usually are some men on the, the show here. Sorry, could you say that again? My apologies. Oh, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> My oh, cell phone sorry. sometimes, sometimes it does funny things and I didn't yeah. ask it to talk, <laughs> but I could, I mean, so much of what you talked about and how we are going to help our children. So, so my, okay, so I can honestly say today, my youngest grandchild who was just born is now eight days old, but all the rest of them are 21 and older. And all of those kids are afraid to ask me anything or say anything to me because they've been, they've been sheltered by their parents in not knowing what their grandfather did. They have protected, as you said earlier, we're so good about protecting those perpetrators. We just do such a wonderful job. And to some degree, I did that too, not because I wanted to, but because society was not ready to even address sexual abuse. And he is out free running today. He is not um, registered as a sex offender. I know he's abusing. I just know it in my gut. And so as we continue down this path, thank you, thank you, thank you for being that person who's going to help teach others how to appropriately talk, not only to our own children, but anyone who comes to us and says, this is a red flag, because even my family just really alienate me a lot because they don't want to talk about it. And they're adults. Right. And I have a huge, huge family and they pretty much all do the same thing to me. They don't want to know. And so when they don't want to know, you know what's going on. So There's something thank you. to know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. And I hope Amanda thank came you. back. Mary, that Thank was you. the four-year-old me that was saying, who knows about old people? I, I know, not, I was just... <laughs> that's not the 44-year-old me, the four-year-old me. <laughs> just want to clarify that. Yeah, well, the, yeah, the not knowing is protect, you know, I mean, we are just, we're just protectors of, of perpetrators. I, I don't understand it. And I think what's so classic that you said, Mary, about your daughter seeing something on Phil Donahue and saying like, okay, when there's people out there in the world, when we all choose to be models of telling and models of vocabulary and models of conversations and models of relationship, we can show up anywhere. We can show up in the grocery store. We can show up at school. We can show up at, um, I don't know, a baseball game or whatever and say, hey, you know what? This is a story that I want to talk about. And and then a, a child can grab onto that and understand and think, huh, that's weird. I wonder what that means to me. And then they will take that. Maybe we'll never know that we were the ones who sparked their inspiration to be able to go to somebody that they know and trust and have a conversation. Ideally, because we know perpetrators are masterful. They are masterful. And a child is never, never equipped. Most of us as adults aren't equipped to out manipulate a perpetrator. There's just no way. There is just no way. When somebody's goal is to take advantage of another person and to manipulate another person, and they're dedicated to that, you're probably not going to win if that's if you're up against that. Okay, I'm just going to let my dog in the door real quick. All right. And then, uh, Teresa, uh, question or comment? When Dr. B gets back here, I'm right here. <laughs> okay, um, I have a well, sort of a question. I started to be more vocal about what happened to me, and my perpetrator was a, a brother-in-law. So I'm on the young end of my family, and um, and it feels good to not worry about anybody seeing me, you know 
say something online or whatever, but there's a little, little voice in my head that sometimes comes up at like 2 a.m. when I'm alone in the house. And what I have seen in my brother-in-law and my sister is such a lack of conscience and lack of empathy that when my imagination starts spiraling somewhere where I go, well, now I'm talking, I could be a threat to them. And if they did all this, allowed all the suffering, all these years, allowed other people to maybe be at risk, and they don't care, they might have me knocked off. I mean, has that ever come up for anyone else where you're afraid that by talking, you could bring more harm to your, or you could. Uh, I, I think that that's, that's so, I think that's a very legitimate fear. You know, that makes perfect sense that when somebody takes advantage of a situation of a vulnerable person, mm -hmm. then when that vulnerable person begins to be a threat, then of mm -hmm. course that person is going to respond possibly with something bigger and more scary. And so I would, I, I want to say, you know, be kind to yourself in terms of that, allowing yourself to have that fear because it is a legitimate fear and it does make sense. And, um, and I don't know those, these people, but I can almost guarantee that and you didn't say whether you were the only victim or uh, that there are know. other, right, that there are other victims because most perpetrators have up to or over 300 victims in their lifetime. Very rarely, a lot of times victims believe that they're the only one, which is what perpetrators try to make them believe. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that they're victimizing people all over the place. And when those people begin to connect to each other, mm -hmm. there becomes a power in that, the power in numbers of recognizing that we're not the, like, we're not the only one for starters, and that by coming together, potentially, there is a possibility of stopping or that person, I mean, that person is not going to stop on their own. Yeah. You know, you know Teresa, um, you bringing up the, you know, saying that, you know, you get that fear piece in you. I'll, I, uh, I can remember feeling that same way. And of course, you know, I had, I had uh, several different perpetrators. Most of them were in this area or just across the state line. And so for, for a long time, I was very nervous. Um, part of my healing process, when I decided to form a nonprofit, I thought I'm going to be the biggest bong, biggest noise. And in part of me, that was my way of basically kind of this is terrible to say it like this, but it was a big F you to every perpetrator I had because they were going to see the business. They were going to see what the business does. They were going to see me. And so there was days where I was like, yeah, hear me roar. And then there were there's times by myself where I'm like, oh my gosh, what if they were to off me? Yeah. What if they go out in public and tell everybody I'm a big liar and that I have mental problems and I this and I that? And, and so, you know, every once in a while, I'd let that kind of overcome me, but it's through the healing and everything else. I think at this point, I'm further, far enough along where I can say, you know, try it. <laughs> Because you're going to be out in yourself as a perpetrator if you come around and start calling me a liar and, and this sort of thing. But it is. That's a legit fear. And I think sure. a lot of us coming from, you know, the, these experiences feel this way. Absolutely. 
Thank how, you so much how for could sharing. You not. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Teresa. Being afraid that they're going to talk badly about you, but have you had fear that they're going to, you know, visit you? And, you know, I, I think that's a very legitimate fear. I, I don't did. necessarily, I don't know them well. I don't know your situation enough to know if it is realistic to think that, but you do. And the fact that you're questioning it mm -hmm. on my end, just as an outsider, knowing nothing about the situation says to me that something inside you has an instinct about these people and the level that they can go to. So I would be cautious always, which you probably are. And I think that we also a lot of times underestimate the power of our voice and they're willing, they're wanting to get more away from you in your voice than more than closer to you in your voice. Because now you have an adult voice that can harm them before you didn't right? You were, you yeah. didn't have the adult voice that you have now today. Yeah. And so you're a threat to them. Yeah. And typically when people are threatened, they back away, okay. right? I mean, just in general, that's typically what happens. Now there are people who don't back away and they move in and forward. You, you have a better sense of how these people are and what their reaction and response to you will be. But the other thing about two in the morning, that, that voice at two in the morning, yeah, you're not alone in that. Uh, everybody has that little voice that actually has its, it's finally quiet enough to hear that little voice and you get to say, oh, what is it they're saying? And they're knocking on the door to tell you something that you need to hear. And, and then you can decide what to do with it. But one of the things they say sort of in depth psychology is that your unconscious mind is going to knock on the door and your job is to open the door. You got to let, let the information in. And so, and it will get to the point where it's a pounding on the door and we have to let that information in to our consciousness before we can ever do anything about, decide to do anything about what, what that message is. But I'm not saying go out and, you know, be prepared that they're, you know, have a murder plan for you, um, you know, I'm just saying that it's it's normal to have those those middle of the night quiet moments that then get completely hijacked by that voice in our head. Okay. It is it is so normal. And Teresa, there's certain people that I've talked to that are survivors where I may say, you know what? In that particular situation, it may not be safe right now or something of that sort. Now, I know survivors that have been trafficked where there's very high profile people and they're in a position where if they did speak out, they very well, it, it very well could be a risk to their safety. That's something that they need to speak with directly to the health professionals that they work with. So, you know, the trauma therapist, their doctor, other law enforcement, this sort of thing to figure out, you know, is this a huge risk? Because certainly, um, it, you know, if I, if, if I felt I was really, really worried, um, I, I would have probably held back. Um, but there was enough people around me that knew the truth that and plus the the safety measures i put in place for myself in my household um they'd have a, it, it would be harder but i think dr b just you know our minds go sometimes and in those fears are real and so i really appreciate you saying that and i just want you to know that somebody else in the chat uh said that they also uh, have that fear sometimes. So excellent comments and question. 
Um, There's another thing. Let me just tell you this. this is my own personal therapist told shared this with me, and I really loved it, which was that there also is in the middle of the night when your voice like just occupies your mind and you can't shut it off, because that happens to me. And I always thought, what is it? Like, did something happen at four in the morning that I'm just not aware of? And she's like, no, that's your brilliant hour. It's your like hour of brilliance. And you need to get yourself out of bed and type out or write out or do whatever it is you're supposed to be doing that your brain is trying to get out of your head at that hour. So there's also just this point in the night when we're, our brain is so settled that we're you know we're trying we need to learn something from ourselves and so it's not necessarily um you know it's something that you are trying to it's all about you and yourself and your learning and growing about what you need and want to know so it doesn't necessarily just because it happens in the middle of the night it's not necessarily a sign from out there as much as it is a sign from in here like you could say i am having excessive worry about this where else in my life do i have excessive worry and does this make sense and sort of try to figure it out does that make sense i don't know uh you know dr b i have to say we have a couple minutes left here um i'm wondering for people that maybe want to learn more about you or or would like to connect with you uh, what's the best way for that i know i had put some things inside our peer support groups as far as websites and this sort of thing um but what's the best way i just threw my website my phone number my email and the podcast delusional optimism that i have on oh, in the awesome. chat room because mary asked and um so you, people can reach me any of those ways. So I am taking the last two weeks of December off. I'm pretty um, having some some self care family time and and Good for you. just yeah, in end of the year and we kick off um, 2022 with a lot of trauma informed care certification module Ooh. classes. So if uh, people are real interested in learning more about really the in-depth details about how trauma is transmitted intergenerationally, how it is impacted by addiction, uh, protective weight gain, all sorts of deep concepts around trauma. You can check out the Academy, which is an on-demand de on library of classes that are specific. So anyway, oh, that's how that. you reach me. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. And I also have to say, Dr. Beasley, that um, we are always so appreciative every time we get a professional on here that can that's that, you know, donating their time. I know that you're incredibly busy. You you uh, have your own things that you're doing. And, and but to have somebody come on that's a professional. Uh, obviously, I am not, and well, uh, so to have a professional come on and 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 give us their time is such a blessing. So thank, thank you, you so very much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. No, and I, I, it's my pleasure. So yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you for having me. You know, I care yeah, about I, this on all levels. So I just you know. I want people to get good information and I want us to shift our thinking around protecting children and, and turning in perpetrators. So not, or not protecting them. So. I wanted to say to Teresa that um, <clears throat> as far as perpetrators go, I know that the perpetrator of my child also raped, raped me. So I became a huge victim of his, but I know he's scared to death of me now but he found himself a perpetrator protector who is now trying to manipulate and infiltrate into my grandchildren's lives. And my daughter told me the other night, don't you ever talk to my children about my mom or don't you ever say anything bad about her. And she said, mom, I want you to know that you are my rock. You have saved my life and I will never ever leave you. And so, I have one on my side at least. Good. 
Yeah. And awesome. only starts with one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really does. And and here's the thing. When you're a perpetrator of children or women or anybody who is technically less power, when you can overpower someone, right? That's actually reveals the insecurity and weakness of the person. So they do have, we have this idea, especially if, if, if the trauma started in, in early childhood, that these people are so powerful. But in reality, they're very, uh, oh, what's the word? It just flew right out of my head. Maybe I'm right there with, uh, okay, that they're, they're, vulner they're vulnerable in weak people. They're not, they're not as powerful as we kind of have created in our minds. Yes, they've overpowered us to some degree or to a huge degree, but they're, but they're fearful and that's why they perpetrate on people who are not equal in power to them, children, women, people that they can take advantage of. So in a, in a situation, I'm not saying that women aren't equally as powerful, equally powerful like men, because we are, but in certain situations, physically men can overpower women pretty easily. And that makes that type of a man a weak. That makes mm -hmm. them that makes them weak. I have not articulated that last statement in any way that's <laughs> intelligent, but <laughs> I hope you get what I'm saying. <laughs> I think you did great. And I think we all, I think we all knew, uh, in fact, uh, somebody wrote in the chat, I get you. So Thank you. I, think Thank it, you. I think everybody understood loud and clear, but Unfortunately, we do have to go. I'd always invite you back, D Dr. Beasley, yeah. because you uh, definitely were a light to all of us tonight. And I thank you again so much for taking time out of your day uh, sure. to be with to be with survivors and and to be with us here Absolutely. on the conversations with Elizabeth. So well, I thank hope you, you all... so much. I look forward to uh, connecting with you on any of these these other. However you want to reach out to me is fine. <laughs> and if you don't, it's fine too. So thank you so, so much. All it was right. great to meet all of you. Thank all you. Right. Happy thank holidays. You. Good thank night. you. Happy you holidays. too. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful Bye. evening, all. Yes. Thank you for listening to the Empower Survivors podcast. Empower Survivors is a nonprofit organization of survivors helping survivors, providing safe spaces of healing. It is an honor to have you here and be a part of your healing journey. Join us for one of our next online meetings on Monday or support group on Thursdays. For more information about our programs, visit www.empowersurvivors.net. We don't have to do this alone. We believe you, we see you, we hear you, and we are here for you now.